What if to be white at Wheaton College is to be a racist? What if Wheaton College is a site of racism? In short, I argue that whiteness is anti-theological. Um, and I'd love to talk to you all about that. So I was, as I was preparing to give my talk, I thought, wait a minute, Wheaton College is a Christian college. So I thought to myself, Yancey, you'll have to hold back. So again, I warn, and I'm warning you, this is not your ordinary philosophy talk. After all, I'm on your turf. A turf, need I remind you, that is, unless I'm wrong, over 70% white. So this is a very white space. So you don't worship in this space or in this space. <coughs> and if holiness has kept the Wheaton College Christian community from looking at white, raci right, white racism or its white racism, uh, then I would suggest that Wheaton College needs to become unholy. So we're born between urine and feces, which is a very funky place. So I consider this talk to be a very funky, funky talk. Because this life, this moment right here, right now, is perhaps all that we have. And I know it's a Christian college, so you guys probably believe, most of you, in the, in the afterlife. But we don't know that. I feel that uh, I will not leave you with much hope after this talk. It's not about leaving white people with hope. That's not my job. We need something far more dangerous, something far more dis disconcerting, and unnerving, alarming, traumatic. And if you are white, do you see yourself as different? from what these individuals are saying. But my question is, are you? Are you? Voice messages. Quote, Dear nigger professor, you are a fucking racist. You are a piece of shit destroying the youth of this country. You are neither African nor American. You are a pure 100% nigger. You would never marry outside of your nigger race. That's a fact. You're a fucking smug nigger. You are uneducated with education. You are a fucking animal. Just like all black people in the United States of America, including that nigger Kenyan that was born in fucking Kenya that has usurped the White House. Yes, it is called the White House for a reason. Because white people made this country great, you fucking nigger. End quote. Quote, hey Georgie boy, you're the fucking racist asshole. You wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for affirmative action. Somebody needs to put a boot up your ass and kick your fucking head off your shoulders, you stupid fucking goddamn racist son of a bitch. You fucking race baiting son of a bitches. Man, you're just asking to get your fucking asses kicked. You need your fucking asses kicked. You stupid motherfucker. Quit fucking race baiting, asshole. End quote. White supremacist websites. Quote, and I warn you, right? Direct speech. Quote. Cunts like this aren't philosophers. They just hate white people. Simple. He should fuck off to Africa if he doesn't like living in a white society. End quote. Quote, this ugly fucking nigger, and it's, whenever I read that one, I go, ugly? <laughs> Did I visit my webpage or what? <laughs> so he says, quote, this ugly fucking nigger is just asking for access to more white females. So I write a letter called Dear White America, which I'm critiquing whiteness and white America. And this guy thinks that I want to date, rather, I'm looking for white women. And I'll just put it out there very crudely, and this will appear in the book. Another white guy said that Dr. Yancey, what he really wants to do, and this is a direct quote, he said what he really wants are white women to suck his dick. That's why he wrote Dear White America. That's white America, people. So I want you to tell you with that, and to know that this was not something out of the 30s or the 60s, but sent to me just months ago. On one white supremacist or alt-white web page, the, the white writer wrote the following. Nigger, 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 nigger. That was the response, literally, down the page. So perhaps some of you are thinking, those messages are from the real racists, not us. And I want to ask, is that true? White students. My white students are always reminding me that they are not racists. We've made progress, they say. We're not like our parents and grandparents. We live in a post-racial America. Yet, and I ask again, what if to be white in America is to be racist? One white guy told me his 
secret thoughts while he was boxing. He said that he always imagined his white girlfriend being banged by some really big black guy, and that this makes him so pissed off that he can go all out in boxing. My question is, if you're a black male, what is it about banging a white girl that puts white guys in such a state of frenzy? Dare I say it? Does it have something to do with fear of the big black gig? Yet, I want to ask the question, how does it feel to be a white problem? How does it feel to be a white problem at Wheaton College? Maybe the white folk can answer that question for me. Black literary figure James Baldwin asks, quote, but if I am not the nigger, and if it's true that your invention reveals you, then who is the nigger, end quote. Baldwin goes on to say, quote, I give you your problem back. You're the nigger, baby. It isn't me. But if I am not the nigger, right, and if it's true that your invention says that about you, then I want to ask the question, will the real nigger please stand up? And if one stands, then how does one sustain the weight of that truth? How does one tarry with that truth? That in the end, white people are the niggers. And given the history of white supremacy, we ought to be the ones who fear white people. I mean, shit, if you're black, you should be scared as hell here at Wheaton College. It's the same with, with Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson said that a male orangutan would rather fuck a black woman than fuck a female orangutan. He says that in his notes on Virginia. Or think of the lynched black body, the so-called feared and disciplined black body, or the body that had to be disciplined and feared. And think here of overkill, just the concept of overkill. For example, in 1934, 23-year-old Claude Neal was accused of raping a white woman. Now, I don't know if any black men, if there's some historians here, you can challenge me if you like, were ever guilty of anything, quite frankly. Because there's a case where a black guy knocked on the door of a white woman. She was startled, meaning she just went, oh, he was lynched, right? So Claude Neal was accused of killing a white woman. Well, white guys went to the jail cell where he's being held. They pulled Neal out, dragged him out. He was first castrated. So his penis was cut off, and they took his penis and they stuffed it in his mouth. And while it was in his mouth, he was forced to say that I like it. Now, how do you do that? Then they cut out, call off his testicles, stuffed those into his mouth, and was forced to say that he liked those too. They hung him up with a noose, tightened it to the point where he became unconscious, and they loosened it up again, and they would begin the tormenting all over. They'd cut off a, neck, a, a little finger, a toe, Eventually, he was killed, dragged to a nearby town where roughly 7,000 white people got to see this black body. In fact, little white children came out with little sharpened sticks, and they got to stab the black body, too. Eventually, of course, his body was sold, the body parts were sold. And keep in mind that white America is so deeply troubled that lynchings would often take place on Sundays. Imagine a holy day. <laughs> Lillian Smith says, you guys have ever read Lillian Smith, you have to read her, wrote a book called Killers of the Dream. She says that she was taught, to, on the one hand, to believe in God and to love God, but to hate niggers. And how do you hold those two things constant? Right? Well, white people apparently can do it. <laughs> and of course, or think here of the brutalization of 21-year-old black female Mary Turner. We don't often hear about women, black women being lynched. Well, uh, a, I'll cast a leave this soon. Um, so it's a black woman, and you guys have, hey, you guys have to hear this. Listen to it. I want you to hear this. Don't, don't leave. Just listen. Say you just got to hear this. So it's a black woman, right? And she identified the, the white guys who lynched her innocent husband. And they said, okay, you're going to tell on us? This is what's going to happen to you. So they tied her up by her ankles, upside down. They threw motor oil and gasoline on her body and set it alight. She was eight months pregnant, at which point a white man goes over with a knife, a butcher's knife, stabs it into her abdomen, opens that belly up like a fucking pig. The baby falls out, hits the ground. According to the report, it lets out one sound, 
at which point a white guy goes over with his boot and crushes its delicate head into the ground. Okay, you guys can hear. That's white America. No, that's your version of white America. No, that is white America. No, it's not. Why don't we, do this? Why don't we do this? Where is that sight? Why don't we have this discussion afterward? That's why it's called you a I'm going first. I'm, I'm going first. You cut out? You leave me out? Where are you going? No, I'm staying. You stay, man, absolutely. That's important. Education is important. But the thing is, white privilege continues to exist. White privilege, white power. We don't have that. Black bodies have never had that. We've always encountered white racism. There's nothing called black racism. Perhaps we need more spaces where white spaces, probably white spaces, break down. And what does that look like when they break down? So like the elevator, spaces where we get to dwell near each other, where you get to see that you are the problem. How do we here within this space, within this at Wheaton College, experience breakdown? For the most part, white people are not in crisis. I would like to see what it means for white people to be in crisis over their white supremacy or over their whiteness. They believe that they are not racists. But once again, I pose the question, what if to be white in America is to be racist? I desire to see white people in massive droves lay down the armory of white privilege and tear apart. I would like to see them in crisis. And now question and answer time. How about coming over to this microphone right here? <laughs> but I've heard you say the N-word more tonight than anyone's ever said in the history of this campus. Good. That's good? Yes. That's the word we want to die. What are you talking about? Let me talk about it. White America sees me as a nigger. White America sees you, if you are black, as a nigger. And I don't want you to forget that. So that's my point about nigger. Okay, now you, you have a lot of anger. Tell the truth. You have a lot of anger. Oh, yes, I do. You know why? You're because talking it's about that story. 300 years of oppression. You were talking about that story about right the people. lady had the baby ripped over and oh, you yes. just cut over like a half and pig? Yes. Because that's how she was cut. What do you, I can, I can, let me rephrase it. Let me rephrase it. There was a black woman who was hung up by her little ankles. Her okay, you're a great propagandist. Can I finish, please? Can I finish? And he sliced her back. Can I finish? She fucking opened her like a butcher with a butcher's knife. That's what he did. Can I finish? Yes, you can. Of course you can. It says in Ephesians that we wrestle not against flesh and blood or against principalities and high places. Yes. I did not hear the word God brought up. I didn't hear the word Jesus brought up. Those people, God? those people, that, that dude that sent you the N word, I don't know, 30 times? All of them. All that's of them. a psychotic. No, he's not. Oh, okay. he's not. You guys invited him here. You guys invited this poison here. Okay. It's poison. Wow. Thank you. So You're a racist. Oh, I'm a racist? You're a racist. You're keeping okay, racism in line. Have I killed white people? I. <laughs> I just want to thank you for your work, very, very comforting, but now I feel very uncomfortable in this space. And so just like taking your question, like what if to be white in America is to be racist, how do I take that question and like continue the sentence? College, you know, like interacting with yeah. like white people in general, like my white professors. Like what do I do with that and how do I like, no, I hear you. Stay safe here. I hear you. you know, but for me to be an anti-racist white, at the end of the day, is to be a racist. The best that white people can be are white anti-racist racists. So what I think you need to do now, if the bar is going to be raised, go to your white professors and start talking about white supremacy. Talk about the ways in which they have failed you as a black student. They have failed to call out their own white supremacy. For me. To be a white supremacist and to be a racist, it's a low threshold. It is to do nothing. Wow. Simple as that. It is to be white. I think that you guys should read Lillian Smith. I think that you should read James <coughs> Cone. Dr. Yancey, I just want to thank you again so much for coming and sharing with us. Should a crisis lead to action? And if to action, what kind of action should that take? Good. And for tangibly for college students, um, what would you suggest where we start? So when I said to you, I don't want to leave you with hope, which sounded counterintuitive, the problem with leaving white people with hope is that they think they're now free. Mm. Wow. Right? So you come to a talk like this, and then you get this lashing by Dr. Yancey, then it's like, yes, we got it now. 
<laughs> Sorry, you ain't got it. One lecture ain't going to do it. Undoing your whiteness and challenging it will take a, I'm not going to use the word that, will take a lifetime. When I walk across campuses that are predominantly white, I feel uncomfortable. Sometimes I feel unsafe. I feel alienated within my own body. But white bodies, when they walk across this campus, don't, my guess is that you don't feel alienated. Some of my grad students say to me, Yancey, why do you talk to white people all the time? Why do you do this? Why write a letter called Dear White America? when at the end of the day they're going to call you a nigger? <laughs> and it's a profound question, my dear. Because there's a part of me that says, I'm going to say it, fuck it. I don't care about white people. Because why? They don't give a fuck about me. So I'm going to invest my energy in black people and people of color. But here's the problem. I've got black sons. And they have to live. So if they're going to live, then I need to talk to white folk about how you have to perceive them. Because when they go for their wallets, they ain't going for no damn gun. I'm sorry, I'm just going to leave with some pessimism. I'm not hopeful that America will ever be non-racist. 